Thank you. In previous classes, we established that perception is the given because perception is physiologically set and provides the primary material for all processes higher than perception. Nihil in intellectu qui non sit in prius in sensu, if I recall correctly. And when we were discussing perception, we saw that it is therefore inerrant. It doesn't make mistakes. There's no such thing as misperceiving. Errors that do occur, we assign to the conceptual level. And that was like a promissory note that now has to be cashed in. Because we're now going to cross the great divide. We're going into the land of fallibility, the conceptual level. Let me motivate it by reading from a section of my book on page 100, because again, I think this is well put. A man's survival, well-being, and happiness depend on his knowing what to do and how to do it. He needs to know that fire can be tamed and that striking together two rocks of a certain kind can make sparks that will start a fire. He needs to know that seeds can be planted, that a keystone will hold an arch together, that two plus two equals four, that a certain stock is or is not a good investment, that the ratio of high-density lipid to low-density lipid cholesterol is important for his vascular health, that a certain person is Mr. Right or Miss Right, that a political candidate is likely to preserve his freedom. Each item of knowledge he needs represents a thought, a proposition, such as a keystone will hold together an arch. Propositions are composed of concepts, e.g. keystone, arch, hold. The mere fact that a proposition pops into a man's mind, say XYZ company stock is a good investment, even when it feels right, is not the least assurance that it is true. The truth of a proposition depends on the validity and precision of the concepts of which it is composed. Will candidate X support freedom? That depends on what the concept freedom means. Is abortion murder? That, in turn, depends upon what murder, human, and life mean. Is it immoral to be selfish? That depends on what moral and selfish mean. So are there objective standards for determining the proper meaning of the terms we use? Such standards would depend upon knowing what the cognitive purpose of concepts is, what role they play in cognition. Concepts are the tools of thought. If the tools are useless, malformed, or otherwise defective, the thought cannot achieve its goal, knowledge. The validity of one's thinking depends upon the validity of the concepts one uses. To gain proper guidance in conceptualization, we must first know what concepts are. And to know that, we must understand how concepts are formed. And that's the topic that we're going to discuss now. Epistemology, the theory of knowledge, gives guidance, as we've said, for the mental processes that you can control. And that turns out to be the conceptual processes, not the perceptual ones. 
It's only on the conceptual level that you can control processes and that you can understand a rule or a principle telling you what to do. Not only can you con control it, you can read and understand and apply principles of epistemology. So epistemology applies to the conceptual level exclusively. But there's a problem. There's a problem in understanding the conceptual level. Before 1966, there was nothing published by anyone that solved this problem known as the problem of universals. As Ayn Rand says in the foreword, the issue of concepts known as the problem of universals is philosophy's central issue. Not its basic issue. The basic issue is the primacy of existence versus the primacy of consciousness. But it's the central, pivotal issue. Continuing the quote, since man's knowledge is gained and held in conceptual form, the validity of man's knowledge depends on the validity of concepts. Now that already, that may sound a little uh, obvious. Man's knowledge is gained and held in conceptual form. But that is very different from the way the issue is approached in contemporary philosophy. They would not understand man's knowledge is gained in conceptual form because they start from within consciousness and they start with two things, language and feelings. Feelings representing beliefs. So already this is a different perspective from the contemporary one. And notice that little word held. Knowledge is held in conceptual form, another thing that we've investigated with form and object. So there's a perspective enunciated here at the beginning that we have knowledge, that we gain it, and that we hold it, and we hold it in a form. This is already just a wonderful context setting that is miles away from how the issue is approached in contemporary philosophy. It's not that far away from but still some distance away from all the medieval or ancient Greek or early modern treatment of this problem. Speaking of the ancient Greeks, this is where it all starts, Socrates. Socrates went around Athens pestering people with questions about the meaning of what they were doing and saying. What is justice, he would ask. And typically he would get an answer of the form, justice is paying your debts. Or justice is being good to your friends and harsh to your enemies. So he would get answers in terms of concretes. What is piety? Piety is making good animal sacrifices to the gods. And Socrates would always say, no, I don't want to know what some examples of piety or justice are. I want to know what is it to be a just act? What does piety consist of? I want the universal. What makes all the examples be examples? What makes all the concrete manifestations be the con uh, concrete manifestations? I want the one in the many. Not the many. You've given me the many just things. I want to know what makes them all just. What is the universal feature uniting all of them? One of his followers was Plato. 428 to 348 B.C., and those dates are approximate, but that's the ballpark figure. Plato went one level deep, deeper. He didn't ask what is the universal behind justice, what is the universal behind piety. He asked, 
What is it to be a universal? What is the universal behind universal? Or in our terms, what is the basis of concepts? So he is the first one to raise, not only raise this issue explicitly, but to give an answer. And not only to give an answer, but to integrate that into an entire philosophic system. Plato is the first developer of a philosophic system. Thales is considered the first philosopher because he enunciates a view of reality. But Plato not only has a view of reality, he has a view of knowledge, a view of the relation of knowledge to reality, a view of ethics, a view of politics, a view of aesthetics. So he has, a, and it's all consistent, it's all of a piece, it's all integrated. So he is the first philosopher. What is the problem in the problem of universals? What is the question that seems to elude answering? We'll get to Plato's answers in a minute, but I first want to list what you have to do to solve this problem. Reality is concrete. Concepts are abstract. Of course, what do we mean by concrete and abstract is part of the issue here. But you can touch this. You can hit it. You can see it. You can lift it. Podium, the concept, you can't touch, lift, hit. Concretes are particular. Concepts are general. And then the biggie. Concretes differ. Concepts treat them as the same. Every table is different, but qua table, they're the same. What does that mean? What justifies treating all tables as tables when they're all different, or most of them are if they're manufactured in a factory? They're damn similar if they come out of the same machine, but they're still somewhat different. And anyway, the table, the tables that we meet and call tables in the world are not all identical. They differ greatly. And there are three theories about what the answer to the problem of universals is. Realism, nominalism, and objectivism. And we're going to discuss each one in turn because objectivism, you need to understand what, why is introduction to objectivist epistemology necessary? What problem does this book solve that's left after the historical figures writing on this topic have had their shot? So let's start with Platonic realism. As you probably know, it's based on a metaphysics of two worlds. There's the world of particulars that we inhabit, where there are many men. But then there's also the world of forms in which there's only one man. You can't see the world of forms. It's not physical. It's not perceptual. But you can think of it as there's a dimension it's not, you know, in the sky like it was for Christianity. There's a dimension or aspect of this world which is the universal level of being, and that is not sensed or perceived. The one in the many is a form in the world of forms. So there are many of us, but there's only the one form of man. To make this a little bit more plausible to our ears, let's say there are many men, but man qua man, instead of using the phrase form of man, let's talk about man qua man is one thing. Man qua man is one thing. It's the same in all of us, even though we vary. It's abstract, even though we're concrete. It doesn't differ, it doesn't change, it doesn't perish or come into being. Man qua man is perfect, eternal, changeless, non-sensory, abstract, 
and has all the characteristics of being a man, fully being a man, in it. Now we can bring up this guy, Antisthenes, who's only known to most of us, including me, for one thing. He said, I have seen many men, but never have I seen man, or the form of man, or man qua man. I see you, I see you, I see you. I don't see man qua man. To which Plato replied, that's because you're not using the eye of the mind, of the intellect. You can't see man with your physical senses, which are just a hindrance anyway. You have to open your intellectual eye to see man qua man or the form of man. Aristotle rejected, isn't that a great statue of Aristotle, by the way? Commanding figure. Aristotle rejected Plato's separation of man qua man from the concretes. It's often put that he smashed Plato's form of man and put a piece of it into each concrete. Aristotle's theory, which is called moderate realism, is that there's only one world, thank God, the one we perceive. He rejected that there's some other dimension of reality. And he said the universal is an aspect of each thing. It's the essence of it. You have man qua man in you, and you have man qua man in you. Each of us who are men are men because we have man qua man in us as our essence, as what it is to be a man. The Greek word for essence is a phrase. It's the what it is to be a man in this case. So when Aristotle says the essence of man is in us, which he doesn't, I don't think there's any real sentence like that. The Greek is, the what it is to be a man is in each man, which sounds pretty reasonable, won't ultimately hold up. The next major figure is John Locke, who put forward a view you could call modern moderate realism. Modern moderate realism is Aristotle without the idea of essence. So Locke says it's not the what it is to be a man that's in you, it's the rational faculty. It's not tableness or the what it is to be a table or table qua table that makes a table a table. It's flatness, levelness, supports. It's the regular old attributes or characteristics which make the thing be what it is. So this has pluses and minuses. The plus is it gets rid of metaphysical essences. The minus is it gets rid of all essential essentiality, gets rid of the idea of essentiality, and kind of levels everything down to the same level, which is a very bad thing for the efficacy of our thinking. So it's kind of good metaphysically, but bad epistemologically. It demystifies concepts, but at the price of democratizing all attributes, making all attributes on the same level. I don't think that was really his intent. He's, he's not one of these, uh, ma let's mash, these people who say, let's mash everything down to the same level. There's no elites. There's no privileged characteristic. I don't think that was his intent. He was rebelling against scholasticism, and he was rebelling against language that was mystifying. And incidentally, Locke has different theories regarding different types of concepts. So I'm talking about concepts of entities where Locke is a moderate uh, realist. Regarding some other concepts, he's not even a realist. But this is what is important for our story. Now we get to the real bad guys. 
this staring figure is Ludwig Wittgenstein, who is the darling of the analytic movement, and that's why I'm picking him out as a nominalist. There are other nominalists in the history of philosophy, starting with that guy Antisthenes. But there is medieval nominalists, such as Rosalind, who is known only for his nominalism. There are earlier nominalists, such as Thomas Hobbes, and there are later nominalists. But let's take Wittgenstein, because he's a beloved figure, and he's got some really bad statements. The one that I am abbreviating up there is... The full quote is, to say that we use the word blue <clears throat> to mean what all these shades of color have in common by itself says nothing more than that we use the word blue in all these cases. You got that? The only thing in common among the things we call blue is that we call them blue. That theory is insane. And there are those who think Wittgenstein was schizophrenic. But even if he wasn't, that theory is, because taken as stated, and of course you can argue that he wasn't advancing this just as his own belief, but just naming it as one possibility, and I don't know the historical attribution issue. But that theory, if someone holds it, would imply that it's a miracle the next time someone points to a blue thing like that shirt and says blue rather than network or parapsychology or 17 or railroad or late because there's nothing in common among shades of blue other than that we apply the word to it. Well, how do we know there's nothing to... How do we know to apply blue rather than any other word because there's no similarity or whatever between that thing that I'm looking at and the other things I've called blue. So it's completely a miracle that two people would apply, would say table independently when looking at this, because there's nothing in common among this and the other things that have been called tables in the past. So that's a stupid view. Um, moderate nominalism is a better view. It says that there's similarity. They use the term resemblance usually. There's similarity among tables. This table is similar to that. What is that similarity? What does it consist of? Well, just a feeling that they belong together. Similarity is not objective, it's subjective. And there are two problems that I'm not going to discuss extreme nominalism anymore because it doesn't deserve it. There are two problems that moderate nominalism comes up with and I'd like to say how similar and similar how. How similar. Well, this is a podium, right? Is it a table? It resembles this, which is a clear case of a table. But it's kind of different, too. Like, it's not really flat here. and It has a flat surface here. Is this a table? It's higher up. You don't sit in front of it. Or what about a, if I keep lowering this table? We get to Japanese table, dining table height. And then we keep going down. Where does it stop being a table and start being a piece of wood on the floor? If it has legs a quarter inch high, is it then a table? So this is called the borderline case argument. Where is the borderline between the similar things? How similar do they have to be to count as members of the class. And the nominalists have no answer. They like to use this to show there's no universal. It's in all an issue of degree and all an issue of where you want to say it stops. How many hairs do you have to have on your head before you're no longer bald? 
20,000, 20,000 in one year hair, you got hair, 20,000 you're bald. Well, it's a, no, an issue of degree. So we can't, nature doesn't tell us where to draw the lines, which proves there's no attribute that's present or absent. Rather, it's all an issue of how similar. Now, similar how really wrecks nominalism because you could almost live with there's no objective way to draw the line. You could almost live with that, but you can't live with there's no one basis for the similarity. For instance, these two entities, a pumpkin and a basketball, are similar. They're similar in color, but I meant them to be similar in shape. Okay? The basketball and the hockey puck are similar in being sports objects. What would you call them? Um, game equipment. And the hockey puck and the hockey stick are similar not only in being game equipment, but in being equipment for the same sport. They're related by what sport is involved. They're using the same game. And the hockey stick and the broom are quite similar in shape. And even in how they're used. So we end up with a pumpkin is similar to a broom. And Wittgenstein actually says there is no one similarity running through the things we classify together. They're family resemblances. But he, he likens it to a, a concept to a rope. There's no one strand of the rope that goes from the beginning to the end. Rather, things are tied together, successive strands. It's just all... A is similar to B in one way, B is similar to C maybe in another way, C is similar to D in another way. So are A and D similar? Well, it's up to your feeling. So that is not a theory at all. Nominalism is not a theory at all. In my book, I call it a pseudo-theory. Extreme nominalism is too dumb for words. That's, there's nothing in common at all except for blue. Uh, except for the word. Too dumb for words, pun intended. Moderate nominalism is just dumb enough. It's not really a theory, it's just hand-waving. Well, we feel these things are, you know, belong together. They, you know, they seem to resemble, so you can all call, you can call them all by the same name. There's no theory there. Because they stead steadfastly resist the idea that there's anything in common, that there's any objective basis for similarity. The theory is similarity is primitive. It's unanalyzable. It's a primary given. You can't get beneath it. You can't say what similarity is. So we can get rid of nominalism and look at realism and say what went wrong in realism. What are the problems that it faces? What false assumptions does it make? What does realism not do that this book does do? Realism has to hold that the universal is nonspecific, that it's, in effect, blurry. So it has to take identity away from blueness or rationality. It has to say that it's general or blurry. It's not a specific rationality applied to a specific topic. It's just rationality in general. Realism implies the cheeseburger theory. That is, just as a cheeseburger is cheese plus hamburger, and if you take away the cheese from the cheeseburger, you got something that's identical to a hamburger, and you can take away the topping from the chili burger, and you got something that's identical to a hamburger. So underneath all the variations, there's the hamburger. So realism holds. There are aspects in which things differ, but if you ignore those, you've got what's the same. So human beings differ 
in their height and their weight and the color of their skin, but they're the same in being rational. That is, being conceptual doesn't mean rational in the virtuous sense, just that they have a rational faculty. But, nice try, but it doesn't work. Let me get to the next one. Abstraction as subtraction does not work. You can subtract away from all of us our varying uh, attributes like height, weight, skin color, and focus in on the rationality. The rationality of you and the rationality of me and the rationality of somebody else are all different. I am rational about the topics I'm thinking about that when I say again rational I mean I use the conceptual faculty. On the topics I think about in the formulations I use with the context of knowledge that I have that stems from my past history and I think about them with the intensity I apply for the duration that I apply it and that's very different from yours and from somebody in China's. So the rationality of people sounds like it could be an attribute, but it isn't. It's already a universal. Look at blueness. Here's the quandary. Blueness is supposed to be identical in the one on the left and the one on the right, but you can still see that there's a light greenish blue towards the right and a more saturated uh, blue on the left fading into the reddish purples. The blueness is not identical in the two things called blue. The blueness, you know, leave aside whether it's on the left or the right, that's position. Leave aside whether it's... Um, near a red or near a green. Other than that, there are, there are pretty uh, stripped down cases here. The blueness is different. We got a deep blueness on the left, a light greenish blueness on the right. Take a really hard problem, quantity. Quantity has to be something that's the same in one, two, three, and four. Okay, but once we strip away what differs, we have no quantity. Two differs from three in quantity. Not only in like its height and its weight. Two already is nothing but a quantitative difference from three. So if we're going to strip off what differs, there's nothing left to call quantity. So what's quantity in itself? Quantitativeness that two has and three has the same of nothing. That's the problem. How can differing things be validly treated as the same? You can't strip away differences to get something that's identical. Abstraction as subtraction does not work. Abstraction is not insight. It's not an x-ray vision into the one concrete. You look at three, you consider three, you stare at it as long as you want, you won't find quantity. You'll find a quantity of three. You'll find three, but you won't find quantity itself, which is the same in four and five and a million. The assumption behind all the realist errors is that concepts work like percepts. They don't work like percepts. Now we get to Ayn Rand's solution. Now we get to the revolution in this book, this, how she solves her problem. Concepts are an interrelating, not a seeing. Concept is a mental integration. Concepts do not zoom in on one concrete. You do not stare at a man more closely and see his madness. You relate, you zoom out, 
you take a wider perspective. And not only on all the men, but on a non-man. You need a foil. You need something that has that belongs in the same wider category, but differs from the things you're conceptualizing. And here is the big payoff. Concepts are formed by seeing that the two things you've zoomed out on, and even the third thing, because you zoom out wider, the two things are close on a scale of measurement compared to the third thing, the foil. Ayn Rand defines similarity as the relation between two or more existents which possess the same characteristic but in different measure or degree. So there is the same characteristic but in different measure or degree. But going beyond that, they possess the same characteristic in closely proximate measure or degree compared to a foil. They won't appear as similar, they'll appear as different if there's no foil. So for instance, if I ask you, is um, Chicago near Los Angeles? You would probably say no. Or you might be smart enough to say compared to what? And I say compared to the distance of either to the planet Mars. Oh yeah, they're quite near. <laughs> They're in the same place, they're on planet Earth, they're in the same continent, North America. Yeah, they're quite, they're, they're only, what, a hundred thousandth of the way, uh, uh, of the distance from either of them to Mars. Yeah, they're quite close. Well, are Chicago and Mars near or far compared to the star Vega? Oh, they're quite close. I mean, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump from Chicago to Mars compared to, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of light years, each light year being six trillion miles, a star like Vega would be away. But, so you see that nearness is relative, right? And similarity is nearness, relative nearness of measurements. Now, nobody has ever said anything like that before. You wonder, are they? Well, you know, actually, let me take that back a little bit. Alan Godhelp found a passage in Aristotle where he says that, bir in his biological writing, where he says that birds differ in the more or the less. And Greg Salmieri has investigated this further and there's some good evidence that Aristotle actually, in his working science, held something like this. That similarity is an issue of the more or the less in the context of a differentiation. So, nobody knew this. It took Ayn Rand to write the theory of concepts to get Alan Gotthelp to notice this one phrase in the parts of animals, I believe is the work. So no, it, it had zero impact on the history of philosophy because it was not part of his writings on epistemology. It was part of his working methodology and statements he made in his biology, in his biological writing. So no one has said this as a theory of concept formation in general as their official theory, but God bless Aristotle got the idea and ran with it in his science and in his comments on his science. So concepts work by establishing a range or category within a commensurable characteristic, such as we did with distance being a commensurable characteristic. Chicago has a certain distance from New York New York has a certain distance from Mars. Mars is, well, all of them have a certain distance from the star Vega. Distance is the commensurable characteristic within which you can distinguish near and far in a relative way. Concepts integrate the range. 
See how I made the dots into a line, which is an idea I got from Greg Salmieri. Concepts do not just recognize these things are similar against that. It institutionalizes that. It integrates a range of measurements into a solid permanent entity called a concept. So that is indicated by the solid line that we now see A and B are in. And notice that A and B are now the same. They're the same in falling into that range or category. They differ in where inside the category they fall, but they're the same in that they fall some where, but anywhere inside that category. So Ayn Rand's definition of what a concept is makes this clear, I think. A concept is a mental integration, not an insight, but a mental integration of two or more units possessing the same distinguishing characteristic, such as distance apart, with their particular measurements omitted. Now, the important thing is to understand measurements omitted does not mean measurements ignored. It is not a subtractive process. As she says, the measurements are omitted in, in the sense of some but any. You have some position in that range, but any position in that range. And she says that measurements exist is an essential part of the process. So we don't ignore the measurements. We don't strip them off. We interrelate them. We say these two are close together as opposed to that one. These two fall in the same region. These two are examples of the blue region, for instance, if we're doing color. We have to use the, the measurements to place them. We don't ignore them. We integrate them. We range set them. We set them in a range. We classify them. We categorize them. And I think the best example I give in the book is a teacher grading exams. So let's assume that the teacher uses the regular scale. 90 to 100 is called an A. 80 to 89 is called B, 70 to 79 is C, et cetera. Okay, now here are two papers. One is in 83 and another is in 87. They both fall in the 80 to 89 range. They're both B papers. Not because you look at one paper, say Jane's paper, you look at it and you say, ah, I see it has B-ness. No, you see that its measurement, 83, is greater than 80 and less than 90. So it falls into that B range. It falls into the range of measurements you've attached the word B to as a, just a categorization of what in reality is a continuous range of possible measurements. So... Ayn Rand gives the killer example uh, or analogy that's, you know, even better than that one. She says the concepts are the algebra of cognition. When you say A plus A equals 2A, and that applies to 2 plus 2 equals 2 times 2, two uh, 3 plus 3 equals 2 times 3, 5 million plus five million equals two times five million. The A can stand for any number. It stands for some number, but it ranges over any number. It's not that there's some A-hood or A-equality or A-ness in the individual numbers two, three, five million. It's that we use it as a variable to stand for some but any specific number, specific quantity. And in the same way, the concept man stands for some but any 
individual human being with his own individual shape, his own individual height, his own individual thoughts, his own individual context of knowledge, his own individual use of language, etc. There's nothing about any individual that's universal. The problem of universals is solved by recognizing that universals are man-made. But man-made on the basis of objective, almost mathematical facts, quantitative relationships that exist out in reality. So whereas the nominalists say that the universal is man-made, they say it's made arbitrarily, you can apply it to anything you want, there's no objective basis, there's no one thing in common running through the things that you classify together. Ayn Rand says that it's man-made and it's made right or it's made wrong. The right way to make it is by a fundamental axis of measurement that is a range within a wider scale of measurement. The distinguishing characteristic that all the things have in common, such as rationality or blueness, is a range of measurements within the wider attribute which she calls the conceptual common denominator. So blue is a range within hue. Rationality is a range of specific measurements within type of consciousness. And anything else you take, the distinguishing characteristic is going to be a range or category within a wider conceptual common denominator, which we abbreviate CCD. Conceptual common denominator is what all things in the genus have in common. You know, the wider category, like man is an animal. All animals have some form of consciousness. Man has the conceptual form, which is way up at the most, I guess from your perspective, way up here at the high end of the number of things that can, uh, its scope, its range, its ability to deal with units. It's way up there. An animal can only deal with a few at a time. The concepts enable us, as we'll see next time, to deal with an unlimited number of units in one frame of awareness. That is what I have for the first part of the theory of concepts. Next time, tomorrow, we'll discuss the integration aspect of consciousness and what Ayn Rand calls the crow epistemology and the cash value of all this theory of concepts. So I'll stop here and take questions. Yes, um, you said knowledge is conceptual. What would you call uh, something, uh, the things that we know and remember that aren't conceptualized ever? Well, such as, as I said in a, uh, could everyone hear the question or should I repeat it? I said knowledge is conceptual. What about other kinds of knowledge like memories that you would call yeah. perceptual? It wasn't me that said that it was, I was quoting Ayn Rand from the foreword, and she recognizes that there is perceptual knowledge, but the relevant form of knowledge that makes man man, the distinctively human form of knowledge is a conceptual level, but certainly, as I said in earlier lectures, yeah. perceptual knowledge, I began by saying a dog knows where it buried its bone. Perceptual yeah. knowledge is knowledge. It's just not a, a form of knowledge that raises questions for epistemology, and it's not the level that human beings can use to survive with. Okay? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so you said that um, the way in which 
specific concretes differ along a CCD is almost mathematical. I seem to remember it being said in, in that it's, it is mathematical, and if it is in fact mathematical, can you explain exactly what that means? It's hard for me to imagine a sort of quantity inherent in my, the blueness of my shirt or the degree of my rationality. Is there a quantity there? Yeah. There it's, is. It's, uh, for the first thing is, is, what is really mathematics here and what isn't? First of all, I don't exactly know. She had a theory that she only hinted at that concept formation and mathematics were really the same in some way and she, to, to indicate that she, to show you that she didn't lay out what she had in mind, she said neurology, cognitive physiology would have to be part of the integration of mathematics and concepts. So I can't imagine what that would be, and she didn't tell us. So that's what I was holding back from uh, implying anything on that level. Uh, it's like, uh, similarity is a quantitative relationship. Mathematics does deal with quantitative relationships. And there's one other link that I have pointed out, which is that Mathematics deals with things qua units. So, for instance, 2 plus 3 means 2 of some but any members of a group. And 3 is some but any members of a group. So, it's, when you say 2 plus 3, it could be 2 apples or 2 thoughts or 2 musical symphonies. It's 2 somethings but anythings. Epistemology deals, so again, to summarize, mathematics deals with things qua units. Epistemology deals with units qua units. What is it to be a unit of a group? So epistemology deals with the same thing that mathematics does, but from a higher level of abstraction. Again. This is one pen. If I had another pen, ah, two pens, okay? So two, it refers to, in this case, two pens. But it could be two fingers. So two is what two somethings have in common. Concepts are what two anythings have in common. They define that. So it's a higher level of abstraction than mathematics, but it's dealing with units, with units, qua units for epistemology. That's as much as I can say on that. Now, the other question was, it's hard to see how measurement is involved in certain things. Yeah, I, well, now that I'm thinking about it, there is a number associated with the frequency yeah. coming out of my shirt. But yeah, what about you, the degree of my rationality? There's see. no number... I'm, I'm sort of thinking about oh, yeah, it. Oh, the yeah, there's there's no a a is. There's no number in my head for the rationality. That's first, of all, first of all, there doesn't have to be a number. There only has to be the more and the less. Right. Number is just a precise way of dealing with quantity. You can say, um, here's my clicker and here's my mouse, right? You can say this is bigger mm -hmm. than this, but you don't have to say it's 1.7 times the volume of that. This is bigger than that. Mm -hmm. You got a, a kid has a rubber band, he stretches it. It's longer now. It's shorter now. He has a piece of clay. It's cute, more square now, and then I do this, and it's rounder now. So the, it's the more and the less. That's why Aristotle's statement is so good. Um, Numbers simply relate the more and the less to a unit of measurement. Where you can't do that, you in effect say, well, I've got two things, this is more than that, maybe I bring in a third, There's less. both of them are less than that. Uh, I didn't give any numbers to the um, example I gave of, of um, 
the, the dotted line and the A and the B and the C. There were no numbers there. I just said these are close together and that's far. And that's all you need. Now, in the case of blue, we can, we can and do quantify it if you just go on your computer to any color, you know, where it says more colors, click here, and you get this display from which I took that blue spectrum. They all have numbers. White is 255, red 255, blue 255, uh, green. Every color you can see is specified by three numbers for the red component, the blue component, and the green component. So we could exactly, exactly duplicate that color on a given monitor by getting the RGB numbers right. And this is done every day by people programming websites, specifying, I mean, I've done it a thousand times myself color, colon, the HTML, color, colon, or background, colon, and then number sign, and then six digits, and then a semicolon, and that's the HTML that will give it to you. Okay, rationality. More and less, we don't have numbers. But you can say the rational, uh, conceptual faculty is working more intense when it's thinking about epistemology than when it's thinking about dinner. It's on a higher level of abstraction, higher, more intermediate concepts. We can say that the conceptual level is doing more when it's holding a wider context. So when you do philosophy, you hold a wider context than when you do math. Math is the minimum possible context. In other words, three, you don't have to hold any, anything in mind about three except its quantity. If you're holding in mind man, you have to hold in mind his body, his mind, the different faculties of his mind, the other people that he's relating to, his age, his uh, experience, there's a whole lot of context you have to hold when you talk about man, or when you talk about consumption, or when you talk about anything very abstract except mathematics. So the context holding in mathematics is close to zero. Context holding in philosophy is enormous, enormous amount of, of, of data involved in that that involves individual differences that you have to keep in mind. Differences within a range, though. Um, so, uh, uh, measurable, other measurable differences in rationale in the con use of the conceptual faculty. Emotional context is one thing that Ayn Rand points out. So, if I say to you, objectivity or capitalism, right? Your heart leaps, right? Objectivity brings tears to your eyes. Should. But if I say, um, uh, time, well, most of us don't have a big emotional reaction to time. So concepts that you work with have a different motivational context and therefore a different power over the subconscious is not an idle thing. Something you're passionate about has a lot of links to other values in your subconscious. So you can measure everything. Some can't, you can't measure numbers, but you can always compare the more and the less. And that's the basis of conceptualization.